How do we live so we best fit in with existing Earth systems? It's going to be made a lot easier if we can reduce our total energy consumption. The main option is nuclear, unless you have huge batteries. It's this great big fairy tale that this is carbon neutral, when in reality it's one of the worst things that people are doing. There's still a very clear relationship between energy use and the increase of income per head. Beats me why we should take something that is dangerous and expensive when there is something cheap and safe available instead. The thing that we don't talk about anything like enough is that if we're going to transition away from fossil fuels, which of course we so urgently need to do, uh, it's going to be made a lot easier if we can reduce our total energy consumption. And that's something we need to do a lot at the global level, and even more so in countries like this, where we, where we, can, uh, where we can more readily do so. Uh, and that's not what the fossil fuel companies want. Uh, that's not the narrative that they want to have. They, they talk about how we're going to meet our rising energy demands. We have to have a shrinking energy demand. Just to bring a wider context on this, um, you know, if you look at where humanity is at at the moment, we've been growing our energy supply by 2.4% a year for the last 50 years. Um, we've been growing our energy supply for millennia. Through our use of energy and technology, it's brought us lots of wonderful things, but it's also taken to humanity to a very dangerous place. Uh, and we are going to need to uh, do a lot of new thinking uh, about how we run society, how we think, how, what kinds of things we can grow, because it's, you know, I'm neutral about whether we grow GDP, but I think it's irre an irrelevance. But we absolutely, it's very dangerous to keep growing uh, our energy supply. Well, I think, I think the risk of that, frankly, is that you end up with a very unpredictable and nasty global recession. And I fear that's actually what we're going to see towards the end of this year and next year, precisely because you're taking such a large bite out of people's disposable income and because that means they're going to curtail their consumption. And consumption may be something that's at the margin for everybody in this tent, but actually consumption for somebody who's on low incomes in uh, Brazil or uh, in India or China is a matter of life or death. So, you know, I want to try and understand this deep green vision, which says we can actually go back to some world where we don't use a synthetic fertilizer, because actually I've seen calculations that suggest that that 8 billion population would have to come down to 4 billion. No. In order to be sustainable. Now, I've, you know, okay. there, may be, there may be other calculations that show less, but the, the reality is it's going to be a smaller population. So is it you or is it you? And which politician is going to have the effectively uh, the courage to turn around and say, sorry, we're going to be operating a one child policy in future or even a no child policy. Yeah, no, it's not right that we can't feed um, even the, even nine or 10 billion people uh, quite happily without, I'm not saying no fertilizer, but drastically reducing our fertilizer use. We can be more efficient in the way that we use it by a lot. And I think you, you're, you're onto that. We can also, you know, the most important thing, uh, you know, simple thing, in, in one sense, simple thing we can do is reduce by a long way the amount of meat and dairy in our diets and the pressure that that will take off the food and land system, not just, uh, not just from a climate perspective, but from a feed the world perspective and from a biodiversity perspective as well, will be enormous. We can do stuff around waste, wasting food less, and we can do a lot of stuff around uh, really sort of careful and highly skilled and not fully scientifically understood yet, but emerging practices that enable a lot more productivity out of land uh, with a lot less input. And actually, that requires a lot more people to work on that land. Um, we, we, we run our agricultural system in a way that minimizes the people working on it because that makes it more, e more profitable per person at the moment. But actually, you know, humanity has got people coming out of its ears at the moment. And one of the most fundamentally rewarding ways you could spend your time is actually to work on that land. So we need more people working the land, not less. So there are all sorts of, you know, it's a very complex area, but there are 
you know, a complete revolution of how we do the food and land system is absolutely part of this. I mean, if you want one solution, it's the generation four nuclear, uh, you know, the small modular nuclear reactors. I mean, that's what the solution is. I think it's a good point to bring in Thomas. <laughs> is that the uh, is that the solution uh, that we should be looking towards? And are there unintended consequences we should be aware of if that's um, how we're moving? Well, um, I think that it currently looks like climate change is the biggest problem we're facing. But um, there's there's there are lots of new problems we can create, and uh, it beats me why we should take something that is dangerous and expensive when there is something cheap and safe available instead. So I, 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 I mean, the nuclear industry has had 60 years to, to improve its design. And every time they build a, a new reactor, it's a scandal. Everybody, the, the builders and the owners end up suing each other and the taxpayer, the ordinary person ends up paying an extraordinary bill. Um, and so, so well, I mean, uh, I don't think they will be cheap or safe, but I mean, of course, we don't we don't know. They don't exist yet. Well, the new generation, it's not uranium. They use thorium, the molten salt reactors. OK, they're, they're much less toxic. This can be recycled. The environmental impacts be much lower. You can't build nuclear bombs out of this. Um, you know, the, the issue is power density. I mean, the whole history of human energy consumption has been toward greater power density and going back to solar and wind. I mean, you, you can't run industrial economies on these low density power sources. You need a high density power source. And right now, the generation four nuclear power plants look like our best option. Martin. I think you can get quite a large fraction um, from uh, solar. Uh, if you have a, a grid to carry energy from the uh, sunny south to the, um, uh, uh, to, to the less sunny north and east-west, hopefully along the Belt and Road to China to smooth over peak demands in different time zones. So I think we can do that. Uh, the main point is that you need a base load um, unless you do have a global grid where you, you can have these things out anyway. And um, you need a base load and the main option is nuclear, unless you have huge batteries, enough to store energy for a long, cold, calm spell. So I think uh, battery technology is the alternative in principle to nuclear, if we want to have a stable a base load. Judy, did you want to come back in? Okay, yeah, the other issue with solar and wind is the land use. I mean, huge. I, I saw an image the other day of this massive solar farm in China that seemed to cover a whole mountain. Okay, and what this does to our ecosystems um, isn't very good. All the mining, you know, in order to go totally, you know, for the batteries and even just for, you know, batteries for electric vehicles. I mean, this is greater than the known lithium reserves, you know, j just for right now. I um, mean, the, the minerals required and the resource use required for this is just astonishing. And the, the numbers just don't add up. They, they don't add up. So I, I don't see how you could go beyond about 20% of the global power provided by wind and solar, unless there's some astonishing breakthrough somewhere that's not currently anticipated. This resource question, I think we have quite a lot of uh, evidence from the, there was a, a very big debate in uh, the limits to growth period. Uh, there were there were forecasts we were going to run out of lead in 1997 and, and all kinds of other things that never happened. Uh, quite to the contrary, there's too much lead around in the environment. Um, I, I am not necessarily that worried that we will run out of lithium. I think uh, that is a, a solvable problem or there would be substitutes and batteries made out of something else. So that, that uh, I worry much more about our, our destruction of um, biodiversity uh, through deforestation and, and through climate change. Uh, and so um, I think actually the, the dramatic increase in performance and, and decrease in cost for renewables is exactly 
the, um, the most uh, encouraging trend I've seen. Um, they keep on falling, but at a fantastic rate. Um, this was always said of nuclear power to be cheap to meet there, but that never happened. <laughs> but for solar energy, it is happening. <laughs> it is falling very dramatically in price. And of course, they're large, these farms, but it, it is, it's a very small area of, of, of the, the planet. And I'd like to say something about this intermittency issue. I mean, large parts of the planet where most people live, you only have to wait for about 12 hours for the sun to come back, and you don't necessarily uh, spend, use so much electricity during the night. So there's still, a, of course, a storage problem. Uh, the parts of the world, like where I live, we don't see the sun for six months at a time. <laughs> there really is a storage problem. But those parts are very small, actually. I mean, there's relatively little people who, who live in this godforsaken place where I live. And we have bioenergy, we have good insulation, we have hydropower and, and low population density, typically in, in Canada, Siberia and Sweden. So there are, there are solutions to that problem as well. look into these technologies, none of them actually will do the job. And also they're at least as bad as fossil fuel. Um, some of them are dramatically worse. Which For ones? Instance, dam. For dams example. are worse. Mm. Absolutely, dams are worse. 23% uh, of the anthropogenic more, um, methane produced is from dams. Um, it's completely human created. Well, uh, and it's 23% of it is from dams. But they yeah, kill rivers. That, let, let's be clear, that's cement, yeah. right? Because, no, because no, you create... it's not. It's the nature of dams. It's because of all the vegetation that is now stuck underwater in the, you know, they make that huge sort of fake lake at the top. That's, you know, the water behind that. And all of the vegetation that's coming down inside the river uh, is now stuck. And it makes layers and layers at the bottom of the dam. And the only way for it to break down is through, it doesn't use aerobic decomposition. It uses anaerobic decomposition. And one of the byproducts of that is methane. And that's why they've been called methane bombs and methane factories, but they get counted by fiat. <laughs> the, the nations of the world just decided we're gonna call this carbon neutral. So all these countries using dams to make electricity, they get to pretend it's this great big fairy tale that this is carbon neutral, when in reality, it's one of the worst things that people are doing. But, but, so but, but hang on a minute, there, be, there, I mean, I mean, hardly any, to... Leanne, hardly any new renewables have come from hydro. I mean, hydro is the oldest renewable technology, but most of the obvious dam places were exploited by the 1970s. So the number of times that people are really looking at big dam projects now, I mean, they've exhausted the pool. So what we're talking about with renewables nowadays is wind, solar, biogas, biomass, geothermal, all of those technologies, and we're going to be looking at a future where we can put those together in a complex system, which actually get, delivers, I hope and trust, something similar to the sort of output that we've got. I entirely agree, it has to go hand in hand. And I think Mike and I totally agreed on this. It's got to go hand in hand with reducing as much as we conceivably can primary energy demand and providing ladders. It's not going to be good enough to turn around to developing countries and say, sorry, you can't do what we've done. Don't do what uh, we do, do what we say. It's not going to be good enough. They could, we've got away with that with mobile phones because you can have a mobile phone instead of your landline system. But, and you can maybe be able to get away with it with rural electricity systems based on uh, solar energy. But you know, a lot of developing countries have now got big cities and they need big grids and they're going to have a lot of electricity. So. Uh, you know, we need a solution there that is actually going to provide them with those zero carbon ladders. And we're, we haven't been providing that. Yeah, I just want to walk you through some of the realities of what it takes to make a solar panel. Um, so you need a very specific kind of sil sand, silicon, which is already rare. It's being strip mined around the world. Um, entire beaches have been destroyed and creatures have been pushed further and further toward extinction because that's where they live. And there are 24 islands in Indonesia that literally no longer exist because they have been mined to death. All of the sand was taken. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that it takes 3000 degrees Fahrenheit 
to turn it into the silicon metal that's needed for solar panels. So near where I live in Washington state, there's this there's a big dam, the Box Canyon Dam, and there's a smelter they want to put in just to make silicone for these kinds of technologies. The, the dam produces 90 megawatts of electricity. The smelter wants 105. And this is a vast dam. I mean, just picture vast dam covering this entire river. And it's not enough energy to produce uh, what this smelter would need. So, uh, and then what the smelter would produce in exchange is 320,000 tons of greenhouse gases. It would be the fifth, fifth largest producer in the state of greenhouse gases. Um, also acid rain, 760 tons of sulfur dioxide, and I think 700 tons of nitrous oxides as well. And then alongside that, you have things like, that we've never heard of, but I will tell you about them. Sulfur hexafluoride is 25,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, 25,000 times, and it lasts 3,000 years. And then there's hexafluorothane, which is 12,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide, and it's 100% anthropogenic. The only reason it exists is because we produce it when we are making solar panels. It lasts 10,000 years in the atmosphere. Uh, people who live near a similar smelter in Iceland ended up with burns in their throats because the air was so toxic from the smelter. Um, they were told not to go outside for months. They couldn't go outside without burning their throats. So uh, this is what goes into it. And you, know, you see all these headlines about, oh, it's gotten so much cheaper and we're all gonna be able to afford this. Well, the only reason it got cheaper is because production moved from Germany to China. And what they do in China is no mitigation at all. They just take these highly toxic products and they just spread it across the landscape. I mean, there are very obvious ways of dealing with localized environmental problems, which we have. I mean, the reason why Eastern Europe is currently a lot healthier than it was in 1989 is precisely because we have applied EU rules to a lot of the industrial activity that was going on there. Now, I don't know about the, the, the particular circumstances or what the federal or state rules are uh, in the US, but acid rain, for example, was dealt with by sulfur scrubbers. Uh, and you know we've been phasing that out, uh, phasing out coal-fired power stations anyway uh, in Europe. So, I mean, I, you know, there, there are ways of dealing with those problems without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And what worries me is that we don't pay enough attention, which believe me, a lot of voters are certainly going to pay attention to, to the fact that what we have has nevertheless given us things which are without any doubt a benefit. So in 1840, which was the first census in this country, the average life expectancy was 40 years old. The average life expectancy is now over 80, 85, slightly longer, 87 for women. And that's happened over the space of this industrial age. Now, maybe all of this is so uh, fragile that it's all gonna disappear. I don't believe that's the case. Okay. I believe that the ingenuity, the science, the technology that we have used to drive that massive improvement in human welfare over the period of the Industrial Revolution can be used again. How many promises have governments and corporations made for decades? As in, what happened to the Kyoto Protocol? What happened to the Paris Agreement? I mean, people can say what they want, but are they doing anything? No. I mean, it's, and I mean, I, at, at what point are we going to start believing this, right? At what point are we going to get, say, this is ridiculous, like this is a whole charade where we're going to have these big conferences, everyone goes to COP, you know, 30 or whatever it is. Like this has to, we, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> like it's not working. If you actually, Ian, look at a, a graph of like carbon emissions, it's just, there's no dent in it, right? It's only when we have bad recessions that there actually is any kind of change. And in fact, we actually have to reduce carbon emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions by like more than 7% a year, every year till we reach zero. If you want to say within one and a half percent. I wrote a column about um, climate change and the need to tackle it in The Guardian first in 1987. And this is an issue which has gradually been uh, kicked around and kicked around. And I have to say the can has been kicked down the road for so long uh, that um, it's easy to despair 
about whether there are political solutions. We've certainly been getting it wrong. So uh, people want to be told that it's easy and politicians want to take the easy steps first. But as with any major change, it's also important that we take steps in the right order. It's not just uh, a question of what steps we should take, but that they should be done uh, in the correct sequence to ensure the smoothest possible transition. And we've also been getting our steps in the wrong order. So one of the reasons why we are facing a gas crisis and we're facing a heating crisis and a cost of living crisis this year is very simple. We didn't look at the long-term need to cut demand for heat in our homes. Now, the coalition government did many things wrong, but one thing it did triumphantly right, we actually passed the legislation in the Green Deal to enable every home in this country to cut its, its energy use dramatically. And remember that we are, as a country, using more fuel, more gas, to heat our homes than they do in Sweden, which, let's face it, is substantially chillier because our homes are so leaky, are so inefficient, that we, have, we are potentially pushing at an open door. But the UK Green Deal home was strangled, not quite at birth, but pretty soon, uh, by the Treasury. It was made overcomplicated by Whitehall, which is a bureaucratic problem, and it was strangled by the Treasury saying, no, it shouldn't be cheaper than if you actually go and get it on your mortgage at home. Now, if you can get it on your mortgage at home, why would you do the Green Deal? Now, if we'd done that, energy bills this coming winter would be up to a third less than they are going to be. And that's a classic case of getting uh, the long term wrong at the expense of the short term. Because at the time, what the Treasury was arguing, what George Osborne and the Conservatives were arguing, was that we couldn't afford to do it. It was going to add too much to bills. Well, tell that to people who are now struggling with enormous increases, 45, 50%, sometimes more uh, in their energy bills. I think the real solutions are gonna be, end up being bottom up. They're going to be local regions figuring out to how to secure their prosperity and environmental quality. It's gonna be innovations from companies, maybe seated with government funding, but I think the real solutions are going to be bottom up, some international oversight and bookkeeping, sure, why not? But the, the solutions aren't going to, I mean, well, you know, when Greta says blah, 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 you know, I'm sympathetic because at the end of the day, all this exchange of hot air, you know, it's not real solutions. She's right that um, um, adaptation um, is important and is far, far easier politically because um, if um, you spend money in a particular nation on adaptation, then, of course, the benefit accrues to that country. Whereas for mitigation, cutting down CO2 emissions, then, of course, uh, um, what we do in one country has minimal effects. I mean, we in, in Britain produce uh, about 1 or 2% of the global CO2 emissions, depending on how you count it. Um, and so even if we meet net zero by ourselves, it makes minimal difference to the world. So in order for mitigation to work, then one does need to have a consensus. And in particular, the consensus has to include the uh, countries of the developing world, which may not now be uh, emitting uh, as much as the global north. But if they develop to anything like the standard of living we have in the north, they will be dominating the emissions. And so the crucial thing is to ensure that uh, they can leapfrog to some technology um, which uh, is better than coal in all environmental respects. Who do corporations listen to? They listen to their customers. If we, as customers, said, we will not buy from you unless you start meeting your carbon targets, and those carbon targets are properly audited and scientifically agreed to, we will not buy from you, we will not work for, for you until you do that, and we will only vote for politicians who will imp implement rules that make that true. If that were the case, 
Corporations could fix it, I think, much, much faster than we expect. Even under the terrible sets of rules we have now, which Helen well described, even under those, we now have renewable energy cheaper than coal in more than half the world. No one thought that was possible. And how was that done? That was done through firms competing. That was done through a few leading firms saying, we must move. Everyone's moving too slowly because everyone's in a box in corporations. So if you run a big cement company, you know cement's a disaster. You know there has to be another way. They've set up a consortium across the industry to try and really discover a new technology. They're making progress. But at the moment, they have to respond to their shareholders. There's no regulation. I think many corporations are doing the best they can in a regulatory regime that is not sympathetic. Well, I mean, I think a lot of this from the point of view of, first of all, there is a, there's a lack of transparency at the moment. And the reason consumers can't make decisions is partly be is because of that lack of transparency, because some companies have a huge amount of control over not only the information about their thing, but about the narrative. They've got good PR companies. We can see the oil companies at the moment telling people that, uh, you know, they can buy offsets, they can just, just take carbon out of the atmosphere. The, 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 this is also about the power in the system. And you can't talk about solving you know, how the problems of capitalism, as you talk about the problem of who, how do you take that power away from the current billionaires? Because that, that completely can, you know, the enormous amount of lobbying, this is the reason people buying things should make a difference and it doesn't. Renewable energy is cheaper, but it isn't because of this lobbying power. But one, of the, one of the issues with uh, the way companies are set up at the moment is that the risks are all external. Right, the companies have, a, there's an internal system, a sort of marketing, you know, you, you, you do this thing, you can cause damage somewhere else, but you're not on the hook for that damage. It's society and the natural environment that is on the hook for that damage. And that is one of the problems with the way things are set up now, is that those, the, the, the damage, you can't close that cycle. If you could make a company completely responsible for everything that happened all the way down the line, then maybe it would work. But at the moment, they're responsible up to this point. And then they just cause lots of damage that's distributed throughout the world that's really hard to see, and they are not responsible for that. Up until now, all of our increased welfare, increased output uh, has been largely driven by markets. Markets with a certain number of constraints, like for example, constraints on sulfur emissions from power stations and so forth, regulation, but minor regulation. With climate change, we've really got to drive the system towards coming up with solutions where we don't have them, and there are a few and cement, for example, really, really crucial, big uh, emitter where we need to come up with uh, solutions, and real economic incentives. And that means putting a carbon price, making that carbon price effective. The EU's getting there, and it's getting good. And I'm delighted to say that the UK post-Brexit system is mirroring the EU system, although don't tell that to the government. Uh, so, you know, there are ways of doing this, but that's, that driving that process of change is absolutely massively going to involve effectively intervention in the market economy that we haven't seen for a very long time, which is why so many people on the right really don't like it. They're not going to do it. So, I mean, <laughs> the thing is, we, you know, people talk about cap and trade and carbon taxes and all this, and like, you know, theoretically, if we got the price right, blah, blah, blah. But what does the price need to be? It needs to be in the hundreds of pounds you know, per ton. It needs to be in the thousands of pounds per ton very soon. And right now, what is it in most places? You know, in, the, in the EU, they had a cap and trade system, and they were trading at like three euros a ton. That's nothing, right? They, they could just ignore it at that point. There, there's a reason why they're not raising it up to the level that it needs to be, because again, you're competing against everyone else in the world market. It's not going to happen. Um, at the beginning, I introduced a quote from Mark Carney saying that really climate change net zero is the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. Do you think that capitalism will fail to capitalize on that opportunity? I think capitalism is very good at capitalizing on things. So if you set the question right, they would do it very well. And my fear is that um, our tools for setting the, quest setting the question that really needs to be asked and not the one that's most convenient to the companies what, that already exist What is questions, the hard bit. just, you know, wh what couple of questions do you think would be How most important? How do we live so we best fit in with existing Earth systems? 
That's the critical question. The Earth is this enormous, complicated, wonderful engine that already does a huge amount of things and is already supporting our civilization. And we're kind of chipping away at it. What we need to do is ask what it's doing and how we should fit in with it, not say, what do we want and how do we go poking? And it's Wh that what humility. Are we what are we missing the most in that? Ma right the now? materials use is a, is a key example, right? Where we just assume there's this one-way pipe that we take it and we put it, uh, we, we've got this place we call away. We're just going to put it away. There is no away except out in outer so space. Materials it's all in coming terms back. Of yeah, so the materials we use is that you have to, unless you, like every single product that, that is made should be made with using recycled materials in its design, mm. like built in, and it should be designed to be recycled right mm. from the start. Mm. And if you, because okay. it, the assumption has to be that we are going to do what the Earth systems do, mm. which is everything is just going to go round and round. Okay. So that's the sort of regulation that you yeah. would need in order to make capitalism work. We must operate this in the same way, on using the same basic principles that Earth's natural cycles already yeah. use. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.